as, a, as dual sensors so that you had to have a backup. But now the team has taken, the, the, the management, the mission management team has taken note of the fact that all four sensors are individually wired. So you have, even with the failure of one, a further redundancy. And they have not been able, as you have reported, uh, to emulate the problem or replicate it and uh, feel very comfortable that at least in this area of the fuel sensors which delayed the launch uh, originally of Discovery, uh, it is uh, not an issue for this launch at all. In fact, they have double redundancy. And that is the good news, Lou Dobbs. We'll get back to you in a little bit. The interesting irony is here, the engineers, as they say, would actually have preferred, in a sense, to see the problem crop up so they could focus on it. But nevertheless, they'll take what they've got here. Let's talk a little bit about the weather. Uh, while it isn't a factor right now, just to give you a sense of some of the issues involved here, I want to walk through some of the rules. It, it is a big, thick book, really, of weather rules uh, that NASA has to live by. For example, heat. Over 99 degrees for more than 30 minutes, no flight. 35 degrees or colder, no flight. That harkens back to the days of Challenger on that very cold morning in January of 1986. Uh, other issues that you have to contend with, wind. A 17-knot crosswind at the shuttle landing facility is a limit. We have no problem with that today. It's breezy and fine. That's in the event that they had a, an abort scenario, which forces them to return to the shuttle landing facility, the 15,000-foot runway not far from where I stand in about 20 minutes time after launch. Now, precipitation, here's the interesting thing. This is a, a vehicle that can travel many times faster than a speeding bullet, Mach 25, and yet it can't fly through simple raindrops for fear of causing damage to that thermal heat shield, which we've all become familiar with in the wake of the loss of Columbia. Lightning, no issue with lightning today that we can tell you about, but if there were, it, this has very strict rules. If it's detected within 10 nautical miles of the pad, or in that planned flight path within 30 minutes prior to launch, there would be no launch. Finally, clouds, going back to that issue of precipitation, any cloud that is 4,500 feet thick, some temperature parameters there, cumulus clouds, the shuttle doesn't fly through it. That's just a little sample of some of the rules that they abide by. We're joined now by CNN's Chad Myers, who's in the Weather Center. He's been watching the weather for us all day. And quite frankly, Chad, not much to watch. It's been really good, Miles. The clouds that you were pointing out about 15 minutes ago, that is the sea breeze. Sea breeze kind of reacts a little bit uh, different than the land breeze. They blow in opposite directions and at opposite times of the day. When the sun heats up the land, it heats it up quicker than the water. This may get to be 95. The water still stays about 80, 85. This air wants to rise and then the air rushes back in from the ocean. And that line of clouds that you see, especially in the early morning and early afternoon, all part of what we call the sea breeze. We're gonna zoom right into Melbourne for you right here. There is not a cloud on, in the sky. There is not a raindrop on the map, and there hasn't been any lightning at all in Florida. Quite the scenario for you. Really very, very good weather. And in fact, no clouds even within 10 miles. The likelihood 80 or 90%. The temperature right now is 84 and the shuttle is on its way up, I think. We're not going to cancel it because of weather today. And this launch window, Miles, of at 10 to 11 o'clock, 10.39 officially, right? That's a much better time than the one we had a couple of weeks ago in the late afternoon when it was really getting heaty, getting hot out there, and we were really starting to see those cumulus clouds puff up. Yeah, each day they delayed, they picked up about 20 minutes yeah. earlier in the day because of the way the rendezvous goes with the space station. And truthfully, 13 days was probably good because it puts them right in the middle of this mid-morning, Chad, as you point out, which is a lot more favorable in Florida in the summertime. Let's, uh, let's talk about the crew. Who's on board this shuttle? Who are the people who are willing to uh, take this flight uh, and take these risks two and a half years after the loss of Columbia? They do it willingly. They do it uh, with bravery. They do it because they believe very strongly in the mission of human beings in space. Eileen Collins, the commander, her fourth flight from Elmira, New York. She was the first woman to command a space shuttle, July of 1999. First woman pilot in 97 in the Air Force. She scored several firsts as well because wherever she's gone, she's been first. So she's very comfortable being the first after the Columbia disaster. James Vegas Kelly is the pilot sitting in the right seat beside her. It's his second flight. He hails from Burlington, Iowa. He's also an Air Force guy. Four children at home. Once again, uh, heartily endorses the risks and is willing to take those risks. Uh, in spite of the fact that certainly he leaves a jittery family behind him this morning. Next on the mission, Steve Robinson, 
mission specialist. It's his third flight. He flew with John Glenn back in uh, 1998, and October of 1998, on this very same space shuttle orbiter, the Discovery. Hails from California. He's in the um, astronaut rock band called Max Q. This morning, as we saw him, he was playing guitar for his fellow crew members. Pr presumably, they enjoyed the strumming. Next on the crew for us is Charlie Camarda. Uh, he's the only astronaut I know from the Queens, that's for sure. He is uh, on his first flight, interesting guy, an engineer with seven patents who spent many years working at NASA's Ames Research Laboratory, comes to the astronaut car a little, with a little different career pedigree and a little different attitude, and um, certainly has brought a lot to this crew. Next uh, member on the crew, also um, strapped in and ready today, Wendy Lawrence, she's on her fourth flight. She would have flown to the space station Mir, but she's too small to fit in the spacewalking suit, the Russian Orlan suit. That's why they call her Too Small Lawrence. Uh, she hails from Alexandria, Virginia. She's a Navy captain, and she is the daughter of a very famous naval aviator and ultimately a commandant of the uh, Naval Academy at Annapolis. Uh, actually, her father was a contemporary of John Glenn in the Mercury 7 and might very well have been an astronaut himself. So she has. Uh, a big um, legend uh, to follow there. Next on our flight is um, uh, Soichi Noguchi. He's a mission specialist from Japan. It is his first flight. He will do three spacewalks along with Steve Robinson. We'll tell you about those spacewalks in just a little while and what they're all about. But basically what they're doing, among other things, is testing ways to repair the heat shield in space uh, new ideas, perhaps sort of a high-tech Bondo kind of setup. Andy Thomas is the most experienced of the crew. It's his fourth flight. He hails from so South uh, Australia, spent 141 days aboard the Mir space station, back in the days when U.S. astronauts were aboard Mir and when Mir still existed. While everybody else on this crew counts their time in hours, he counts it in days. And uh, let's take you to the firing room and just show you what's going on there. I'm going to bring in Jim Riley, our astronaut, who's been listening very intently to the calls there. It almost looks routine. It almost looks matter of fact in there. And I know they drill these things over and over again, but there's got to be a little different feeling in that launch control center right now, Jim. You know, everybody's looking really tightly at their screens, just making sure that everything is perfect for uh, this first flight in two and a half years. So I'm sure they're very carefully uh, looking at what they got. Looking tightly, focused intently. Clearly that uh, sensor issue is on everybody's mind. We're in the time frame soon where there'll be another test. When is that coming up and do we know how critical that particular test will be? Exactly. In fact, before we come out of this hole, they're going to do one final test of this uh, last set of eco sensors. So they're going to be looking at it and setting it to the dry state, which has passed perfectly all morning long, ever since about 3 o'clock this morning. And they'll try it one more time before they get the final go for a launch from the NTD. So conceivably, if there's a problem that crops up at le this late juncture, there could be a problem. Uh, might, be, might necessitate a scrub, but there's no reason to believe at this point that those sensors are not operating properly. So far this morning, everything has worked perfectly. No, no uh, issues at all. Tell us a little bit about this crew. This crew has had, in, some of the crew have been together for more than four years. They were uh, brought together. There was a bit of a reshuffle after Columbia, but some of them have been training for four years. What's it like to train for four years for a moment like this? I've, I've never done it, but I can imagine that uh, they are very tired of training and ready to go to space. Now, here we are in the photo opportunity, which happened early this morning, the wee hours. Um, we're not sure about the sartorial selection of Hawaiian <laughs> shirts. Maybe you have some insights as to why they went that way. Well, the, the, your crew breakfast is a routine where you wear a crew shirt and everybody's dressed alike. And uh, obviously, they were in a celebratory mood and ready to go today. All right. And below that banner, you can barely see it as a cake. And there's Steve Robinson strumming that guitar for them. I'm not sure what he was singing or playing. But I've never seen anybody actually eat that cake. Have you eaten it? Yeah, actually, when we come back after the flight, they'll save it for us, and they'll freeze it, and uh, we eat it when we get back. Now, the walkout, of course, that's, um, you know, part of the whole ritual here. As you walk out and go off into the uh, Astrovan, is there much conversation among the crew members in the Astrovan, or is that just kind of quiet time? It uh, depends on the crew, but uh, both of the crews that I've flown with, uh, we were pretty talkative on, on both, both situations we when we were going out. That's the one time when you've got uh, a little time to just kind of be yourselves and, and talk to your friends. Well, it gets down to a point where you have, uh, I guess, in a sense, less to do at any given moment, right? You have fewer distractions, I guess, exactly. would be the way to describe it. So you, you uh, ultimately, you make your way up to the 195-foot level. They call this the white room, because it's painted white. The closeout crew gets you in there. 
And that whole process of strapping in, something you do time and again in simulations and so forth, still got to be different on launch day. It's like going into the big game, isn't it? It really is. No matter how many times you simmed uh, this kind of an event, there's nothing like the day you're going to go do it for real. And so these guys will be focused very tightly on their job that's coming up with, you know, leading into the launch and, of course, in the launch sequence itself. But the guys, particularly on the mid-deck, are thinking about what happens as soon as you get to orbit because they're going to be very busy for the next two hours after that. All right. Jim Riley will stay with us. We're going to take a break. Uh, so far, we haven't heard anybody say no-go for launch. The poll has been successful thus far. As they go through all those various positions, people focused on those screens. When we return, we'll talk a little bit about what happened two and a half years ago, Columbia, and what has happened since. How this shuttle is in so many respects very different than the one that took off here in January two years ago. Stay with us. I have never had any pressure for my family to not fly this mission. My parents, my husband, my children, my friends. Uh, you know, I would think that I would have, but I haven't. Having said that, I have asked myself, do I really want to fly this mission many times? And the answer always came back, yes. I was here, it's January of 2003, and the space shuttle on the launch pad, same one as a matter of fact, was the space shuttle Columbia. Um, 16 days later, of course, we lost Columbia and her crew of seven. During that launch, we didn't know right away what happened. There was the crew as they came out. That familiar scene you just saw here a few moments ago with the crew that is currently on board the space shuttle Discovery. But a little more than a minute after uh, liftoff here, a piece of foam, about two pounds in weight, about the size of a briefcase, fell off, striking the leading edge of the wing. And 16 days later, this was the scene that we saw over the skies of Texas as it re-entered. It created a lethal hole in that heat shield on the leading edge of the wing. And the shuttle broke up, was destroyed in the 3,000 degree heat of re-entry. It's left an amazing emotional trail behind it for the family members, for the NASA family, for people who feel strongly about space exploration. Not long ago I spoke with uh, Dr. John Clark who is a NASA flight surgeon and who lost his wife Laurel aboard the space shuttle Columbia. Listen to what he had to say. I would have would have traded for my wife in a heartbeat even at the last second when the vehicle finally broke up. I mean I would have much rather had me lose my life than have her lose it. But sometimes we have to face our worst fears. Her worst fear in life would be to lose her, you know, to be, not be there for her son. My worst fear would be a, to be a single parent, and both of those fears were materialized. John Clark talking about his worst fears, Laurel Clark's worst fears, and there was the crew that we lost on that day. The crew today will be carrying a patch to remember the Columbia 7, and they will spend uh, a couple of moments in space uh, taking time to remember them. And uh, their commemorative patch, as a matter of fact, if you look at the top there, uh, is symbolic of Columbia and her crew, uh, the seven stars, symbolic of the lost souls on that mission, February 1st, 2003. NASA has had to recover emotionally and also has had to do a lot of good, hard technological and engineering work in order to get to this point today. Uh, we can talk a little bit in just a moment about how they've changed the way they make decisions, which were in fact kind of the root cause of the Columbia disaster. But there are some key things to point out just in how they have changed the orbiter and the space shuttle system in general. First of all, let's take a look at a sort of a God's eye view of where we sit right now, if we could. We'll just give you a sense of where we are. We're right in this area right over here. About uh, three and a half miles away is launch pad 39B. Let's zoom in and we'll show you what's changed on the space shuttle Discovery and for that matter on all space shuttles to follow uh, over the next few years. Inside the leading edge of the wing, there's a series of sensors that have been put in here which would detect a strike, would actually feel the motion of a strike if something were to hit that fragile area there and in addition would be able to tell them if there was a breach which could cause a problem with the heat shield on re-entry. 